Thank you very much, Bonnie. Great introduction. Um, most of the time, the entertaining comes because I'm giving extemporaneous remarks. Uh, this is actually a cleared address this time. I can't even remember the last time I did that. But um, when needed that for this audience, this is the most impressive uh, collection of, China, of uh, Taiwan hands ever assembled in one place, I think. It's, uh, it's very, congratulations to Brookings and CSIS for bringing together such a terrific group. Um, today, 35 years after the Taiwan Relations Act went into effect, it remains, of course, the guiding document for our important and valuable relationship with Taiwan. Uh, and, I, and I agree with President Ma when he says that U.S.-Taiwan relations today are stronger than ever. In some respects, maybe even stronger than before 1979. In 1979, there were many in the White House, many in the State Department, who did not expect that in 2014 we would still be talking about U.S.-Taiwan relations. Unfortunately, that's, that view is supported by the historical record that has been coming up. They certainly would never have imagined that it would be such a close and important relationship today. As we've heard earlier today, the tendency then, the tendency for quite a few years afterward, was to treat U.S.-Taiwan relations as an issue, or treat Taiwan as an issue, a problem in U.S.-China relations, rather than as a separate, substantive, meaningful relationship in and of itself. Today, we do take our relationship with Taiwan seriously, we do treat it as a relationship on its own merits. The language of the TRA continues to be very relevant, I think, for policy concerns. And I think it's instructive, as we did a little bit today, but I want to continue that, to look back at how some of that language evolved into its final form. Discussion of the TRA usually focuses on its language that commits to the United States, quote, to provide Taiwan with arms of a defensive character. Quote, to maintain the capacity of the United States to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social economic system of the people of Taiwan, end quote. And to a determination by the President and the Congress of appropriate action to take in response to any threat to Taiwan's security. This language is the core of our, of America's unique defense commitment to Taiwan, a commitment made, of course, by no other nation. A review of the legislative history, which we were treated to this morning, shows that Congress added much of that language, I wrote much, after hearing this morning I would say most of that language, to the original executive branch draft text of the TRA. The underlying policy for this commitment was spelled out in, I think, language that's also very important in the TRA's preamble. Quote, to make clear that the United States decision to establish diplomatic relations with the PRC rests upon the expectation that the future of Taiwan will be determined by peaceful means." End quote. That policy, that policy of expectation that the future will be determined by peaceful means, and all the commitments that follow from that policy remain unchanged 35 years later. The, T the TRA's defense commitments, I think understandably, get most of the tension. But the act's underlying, the act's broader, more fundamental goal was, quote, to preserve the, and promote extensive, close, and friendly commercial, cultural, and other, and you can drive a truck through other, of course, <laughs> relations between the people of the United States and the people of Taiwan, end quote. That, the entity that then was created to manage the continuing relationship is, of course, 
our dear American Institute in Taiwan. We all know the Institute functions in nearly all respects the same as an embassy, with representation of all the U.S. agencies that you would expect to find in an embassy, and the capability to represent U.S. interests on all issues. Moreover, the AIT format became the model for many other countries that subsequently, or in some cases even earlier, had broken relations with Taiwan. So you, can, you could say that indirectly, the creation of AIT, the format that we came up with for it, contributed to Taiwan's ability to maintain close ties with numerous other countries. Over the years, we have, in fact, made a few adjustments to make the relationship, to make the AIT structure work more smoothly. I could give many examples, but one, that, one of the most obvious, I think, is that a, a few years ago, about a decade ago, we decided to send active duty military officers to serve at AIT instead of relying on retired officers, which had been the practice since 1979. But, but the basic structure of, of how we deal with Taiwan, the basic structure of AIT is unchanged and it is now really largely mirrored by the structure of Dr. Shun's Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Washington. The TRA drafters were very careful to ensure that agreements between the United States and Taiwan prior to 1979 would remain in effect to, to spell out, and also to spell out how future agreements made between the U.S. and Taiwan would, co would come into effect. Today, um, AIT manages and oversees the implementation of over 100 agreements and arrangements between U.S. government agencies and their Taiwan counterparts, all handled through AIT and TECRO channels. At the same time, um, right now, uh, over a dozen additional, I think it's more like 15, 18 additional um, agreements are, are currently under discussion. And if you look at the breadth and at the, of, of, of pending agreements, of existing agreements between, the United, between AIT and TECRO, I think it attests to the very wide-ranging substance of our interaction with Taiwan. It ranges from defense and security issues, environmental cooperation, energy efficiency, scientific and technical collaboration, law enforcement, uh, training programs for people from other countries, and so much more. Now, on the occasion of the TRA's 35th anniversary, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell testified in April before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee's East Asia and Pacific Subcommittee, uh, my friend Kim Moy, our Deputy Assistant Secretary, testified in March before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So those testimonies outlined in considerable detail the current state of our economic, cultural, and security ties with Taiwan, as well as our support to have, for Taiwan to have meaningful participation in international organizations. I will spare you from repeating all of the excellent information available in their testimonies. But I'd just like to highlight what I think are a few important points. Let's return for a minute to the important subject of our support for Taiwan's defensive needs. We believe that support has given Taipei the confidence in its engagement with Beijing. The result has been the impressive string of agreements on trade, transportation, law enforcement, cooperation, and other cross-strait ties that have been concluded in the past six, six years. President Ma has certainly made clear, both privately, many conversations that I and others have had with him, and publicly as well, the connection that he sees between American support for, for Taiwan's defense capability and Taipei's ability to negotiate confidently with Beijing. 
The Obama administration has notified our Congress of over $12 billion in sales of defense equipment and material and training to Taiwan. As China's military spending grows, as China continues to carry out military deployments and exercises that are aimed at Taiwan, it is more important than ever for Taiwan to invest sufficiently in a professional military force that uses asymmetry, innovation, and other defensive advantages it can muster to deter potential attempts at coercion or aggression. Our security relations with Taiwan are about much more than arms sales. The U.S. engages in a wide range of consultations and exchanges with Taiwan in order to assist Taiwan's armed forces as they seek to maintain, to train, and to equip a capable, effective self-defense capability. Our defense support for Taiwan is based only on our assessment in close consultation with Taipei on what Taiwan needs for its defense. As we have assured Taiwan many times before, we have not and we will not hold prior consultations with Beijing on arms sales to Taiwan. Our economic relationship with Taiwan is, is also something of great mutual benefit. Taiwan is, I was going to say 12th, I now know from Lu Xun it's 11th. You know, it goes up, it's been 10th, it's been, it, 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 you know, so, <laughs> it's 11th. Um, largest trading partner, it's a top 10 uh, also destination for U.S. agricultural and food exports. Uh, big market for all those things. I used to like to say that Taiwan per capita is extremely high. It's like the number two. I used to like to say Taiwanese people like to eat, drink, wear, and smoke U.S. agricultural products. And I, 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 I was criticized for I was criticized for the smoking part, you know. But I said, you know, the numbers don't add up. You know, if, if it's no longer number two per capita if you take out the, the tobacco, so we have to leave it. So, sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that is departure from the clear text. Yes, right, yes. <laughs> uh, um, thing, Taiwan investment in the U.S. is, um, for, for a long time, was a pretty, pretty stable figure. It's growing. It's really picking up. Um, I had the honor of accompanying former Vice President um, Vincent Xiao and his big delegation of top CEOs when they came here last November. Uh, just during that trip, uh, Formosa Plastics announced that it was uh, putting $2 billion into uh, its already large petrochemical facility in Texas. Um, I've talked to a lot of other top CEOs who are seriously working on and moving toward other major investment projects in the United States. Um, I think the, the, the price and supply of natural gas in the U.S. has become a major factor attracting these investments, added to all the other things we have going for us here that make our attractiveness as a managing, as a manufacturing hub or as an export platform perhaps better now than it's been in past years. Uh, Taiwan tourists to the U.S. also have increased significantly, started out a little slow after visa waiver, but it's picked up. Um, and and, and that, that's another very positive factor. Now, these are all tangible factors, whether it's tourist numbers, investment numbers, exports, you know, things we can, we can put a figure on, which immediately benefit the people and companies in the U.S. and in Taiwan. But I think we also know from our Taiwan friends that it is very important for Taiwan to maintain its economic autonomy based on a diverse spread of trade and investment ties, including the United States, Japan, Europe, and its Asian neighbors. Economic autonomy, like self-defense capability and international dignity, is an important factor in giving Taiwan the confidence to strengthen 
cross-strait ties. For both strategic and economic reasons, we attach great importance to the resumption of our TIFA Council uh, talks, Taiwan uh, Trade and Investment Framework Agreement talks at the deputy ministerial level a couple of years ago. Our economic dialogue and activity um, with Taiwan has increased in a number of ways, and we're looking to increase investment, increase trade, and to help Taiwan maintain a balanced, balanced economic relations in the world. I'm going to just close by noting that um, I think, and I've said this at other gatherings, I think an excellent symbol of the importance we attach, uh, the commitment we've made, not just to current U.S.-Taiwan relations, but to the future, is the uh, splendid new office complex for AIT that we are constructing in, in the Nehu district. Uh, I picked the site out myself. It was quite a long time ago, but it's getting, uh, it does have great feng shui, by the way, also. So, but uh, has the mountains behind and the river in front and so forth. Um, seriously, it's, uh, the main building is uh, large, modern, attractive. Those of us who've seen some of our other new embassies in the world may find the word attractive surprising. Um, this one really is, not like the embassy in Bangkok, where you know, it was, on, for example, uh, sorry if anybody personally involved in that, but kind of looks like a federal prison. So, um, <laughs> um, we expect to move in. We expect to move in to the building in Nehu um, at the end of next year. Okay, and um, very important point. Seriously, this will be the first dedicated office building that any country has b built in at least 30 years to have as its representative office in, uh, in Taiwan. I think that's a, you know, a great symbol of our longstanding and important future relationship. The core of, uh, our sh of that relationship has always been our shared belief. I shouldn't say always been. I say it's been since the late 80s. Our shared belief in democracy rule of law and human rights. Americans have a deep respect for the extraordinary economic and political progress that the people of Taiwan had made. I would say made against all odds, frankly, in the 35 years since 1979. And for our part, we will continue to stand by the commitments that we made to Taiwan 35 years ago. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you did not disappoint, Ray. It was both entertaining <laughs> and informative. Ambassador Burkhardt has agreed to take a few questions. We have about 10 minutes, so please keep your questions short so we can try to work in um, more than just a couple. I see all the journalists have their hands up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Journalist number one, John Zhang, over there. John Zhang with uh, CTI TV of Taiwan. Um, Mr. Ambassador, you, uh, you uh, talked about Taiwan's economic autonomy. Um, how do you see the recent uh, student demonstrations in Taiwan against the uh, 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 service trade agreement across the uh, strait? Thank you. Are you concerned in any ways that uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of demonstrations is not just against any agreement uh, with the mainland, but also uh, um, you know, uh, having uh, um, impact on uh, other uh, free trade uh, agreements that Taiwan may uh, be interested in signing. Thank you. Thanks. I, I mean, all my friends are mouthing things to me and sort of trying to give me signals here. But, you know, so, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I, I know over analysis is the greatest you know, the most popular pastime in Taiwan of anything, you know, so, and we, we try to avoid falling into that trap as much as possible. Um, I, I, I've seen some interesting comments by Taiwanese I respect, including people, you know, who are close to the president about these, these and I've seen comments, uh, you know, I, 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 I see, look, I'm going to speak as, a, as an analyst here, you know, of Taiwan, not, I mean, I, the student demonstrations seem to reflect wariness about 
the pace of integration with the mainland. Okay, I, I don't see them as a as a um, I didn't see them personally as a comment on uh, on a sort of protectionist sent sentiment. You know, I mean, uh, I think anyone can see that there were no demonstrations against the free trade agreement with Singapore or the free trade agreement with uh, New Zealand. Um, so the conclusion, I guess, most of us would draw is that 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 this seemed to be all about relations with the mainland and how they felt that, it, that those were being handled or, you know, fears about where it was going. And so um, I, I, I'll just leave it at that. Chris? I'm oh, sorry. Right. Taking your job away here. Yeah. As long as you don't take my salary. Gonna, thanks. <laughs> this is the journalist hat. Uh, Chris Nelson, also an important. Uh, following up on, on John's uh, economic question, um, uh, our ambassador this morning uh, very clearly says, you know, Taiwan is super interested in getting in TPP. Uh, we've said we're certainly, uh, uh, well, we would welcome that. Uh, our friend, the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in, in Taiwan says, yeah, but if you really want to get into TPP, you need to do the economic reforms that we've been talking about for years. Do them, and then USTR can go to the White House and say, they're ready, let's, let's see what we can do here. This is a classic chicken and egg uh, uh, problem. Uh, how do you see it? What advice do you give? And if there's a prediction you could give, that would be great. Thank you. First of all, um, when I mentioned that we've, we've, we've really revitalized our economic dialogue with Taiwan, not only at the deputy ministerial level in the annual TIFA Council talks, but in lots of lower level talks and in some of the policy meetings we have with Taiwan, you know, economic issues are things we're, we're deeply engaged in talking with them about. And obviously, you know, TPP and what that involves is, is, is one of the topics. So um, there's no shortage of interaction between us about that subject as well as many other subjects that are important uh, for economic and trade relations of Taiwan, the United States, and Taiwan with the world. Um, the, the, the reality, just a few facts. Uh, TPP is now a dialogue, is now, the, 12 countries are now involved in the first stage of TPP negotiations. We're, we're, we need to finish that round. Taiwan understands that, everybody understands that. When that round is finished, then the talk, then, then the talks will be open to other negotiating partners. The, the nature of, the, of TPP is that there has to be um, consensus, there has to be agreement, I think it's not just you know, agreement among the existing uh, partners on admitting new partners. The way the process works is negotiating partners are not actually invited to join. That's not the way the process works. Uh, you know, when Japan came in or Mexico, and the same process would apply to Taiwan or anyone else, a new negotiating partner up, uh, expresses interest and, and applies to join. That, that's, uh, that's in fact the way the process works. Taiwan wants to, be, wants to join the TPP negotiation second round it would apply to, to join. Obviously, you do that after a lot of groundwork. I see Taiwan is doing that groundwork. That's all public, you know, talking about all the work that, that, that President Ma has gotten his administration to do, all the work that Taiwan's, um, Taiwan's uh, representatives around the world have been doing a meeting with not just the United States, but with all of the 12, um, Lucian's uh, um, uh, colleagues in 11 other places, 11 other countries are also have engaged with those, uh, co with those countries about, about TPP. So Taiwan's doing the right things in this process. And I, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, let's take uh, one last question. Maybe somebody who hasn't asked a question yet, Norman. Uh, 
Uh, excuse me, uh, Ambassador Burkhardt. My name is Norman Fu. I'm a columnist of the China Times. You gave a very upbeat account of U.S.-Taiwan relations. However, in the meantime, there have been uh, some disturbing developments. I refer particularly an article by a University of Chicago professor entitled uh, Say Goodbye to Taiwan, published in the National uh, Interest Magazine. His argument is that when China rises, the U.S. ability to defend Taiwan will diminish incrementally, so much so to the point one day the United States will be unable to defend Taiwan. That will be the time when the U.S. will have to say goodbye to Taiwan. You buy that argument of this professor? <laughs> yeah. I, I was um, recently at a very, uh, very interesting discussion of uh, U.S. officials and former officials with Taiwan officials and former officials. And I made sure that this, that Mearsheimer's article was on the agenda. And it was, uh, it was a great discussion. And um, I, I can't quote any of the people involved that was part of the terms of the conversation, but uh, we were treated to um, a, a really great analysis of, of uh, the realist, the so-called you know, realist foreign policy uh, analysis and some of the alternatives and uh, where Mearsheimer fit into, uh, into all that. Um, one of the fascinating factoids that came out of the conversation is that people who are actually, one of the people there was actually involved in teaching a lot on the mainland, in Beijing University and so forth, and he said the, uh, the Chinese students of international relations love Mearsheimer. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is that true? True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I, th I think this kind of analysis, you know, it's it's good. It gets you thinking. Gets you looking at, at at what the situation is. But I think there are a few obvious comments that would make about it. One is, um, you know, islands have certain defensive advantages whether it's uh, Japan or Britain or Taiwan. I'm not sure Mearsheimer completely, or I'm not sure we as a government are sure that Mearsheimer completely took that into consideration as analysis. The other thing I would say is that, um, just going back to some of the comments that Randy Schreiber made earlier and so forth, we in fact do have a very um, in-depth discussion with Taiwan at, at all levels, about um, you know, ranging from policymakers to sergeants, about um, what Taiwan's defensive needs should be, and uh, I'd say we've made a lot of pro we've made real progress, uh, both sides in working. And I mean, this business about you know asymmetrical weapons and so forth. I mean, it's not just a mantra. Um, where we, we've looked at what Taiwan needs, and and, I, and if you look at what Taiwan has done in its own indigenous, indigenous defense development work, as well as in what it's bought from other people, you see just exactly the kind of items that make sense in terms of dealing with the kind of threats that Mearsheim was talking about. And that includes, uh, look, I'm not a military man, but I'll tell you the, the kind of things the military people look at and like, you know, mobile anti-ship missiles, fast patrol boats, greater capability to handle naval mines, both removal and putting, putting them in. And, and the list goes on, you know. I mean, and, and Taiwan's getting good at this stuff. And this, is, uh, and this represents uh, exactly the right kind of attitude. You know, Mearsheimer looks a lot at, 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 at the balance of forces on the other side of the strait. There are only two things that matter in terms of what Taiwan has to do in terms of defense. Deterrence and survivability. Has to be enough deterrence to 
I, I, liked, I liked Andrew's phrase, enough deterrence to know, the, for the Beijing to know it would get a bloody nose. Great way to put it. And, and make them really have to think twice. Survivability, it means surviving long enough until, let's just say, external factors can be brought to bear to resolve the conflict. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the other half of his argument, what does it mean in terms of U.S. US commitment and U.S. US capability? Um, commitment is something and, and, and it's something we have to, you know, we, 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 we say it, and as Randy Schreiber put it, we have to walk the walk, too. We have to, we have to do things which show it's still there. That's important. In terms of capability, um, I spent a lot of time at the Pacific Command. Uh, being able to deal with, with with A2AD, being, being able to deal with uh, area deni denial and access, to, uh, and access is, these are exactly what, they're, what, 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 what all the plans are about. Exactly what, what, what these, are, these are exactly the important issues. And um, I'm, for one, I'm fully confident that, if our, that our military will be able to do that. So thank you very much.